the, the purpose of the practice is to, I guess, kind of uh, help with all of Millwood Brown kind of using techniques based on um, cognitive neuroscience and psychology. Our role is really to kind of educate the rest of Millwood Brown, help them through the process of delivering those sorts of client, those sorts of projects to clients and helping them interpret them and, you know, kind of get the insights out for the client. I think it is strategically vital to what we do. As we have learned more about the, you know, the way people interact with brands and marketing, so we've learned more about how people make decisions. I think we realise more that we need to be going beyond uh, some of the existing tools. And that's not to say, and really isn't to say that survey-based work or qualitative work isn't valid because it absolutely is. We wouldn't have the behavioural validation that we have for those things if that if it weren't working. But I think what this does is give us an additional dimension, an additional insight about things that we perhaps haven't been able to see before. And I, I just I genuinely think it will lead us to, you know, better understanding of how consumers make decisions and therefore better better business decisions. I think it's still a huge growth area because I think although it's true to say that pretty much all the major marketing you know kind of companies around the world, all the major brand owners are experimenting or have done experimentation in this field, it's not by any means kind of reached any kind of plateau. I think you know people are beginning to do more work with it, they're beginning to see what works for them and what doesn't. And as they do more of that, I think you'll find more and more companies kind of start using it more regularly. A few years ago we were very much uh, looking at kind of the learnings from uh, neuroscience and psychology, applying that to, to what Millwood Brown does, changing some of the questions that we ask and, and so on. Um, that still goes on within the business and that learning is still being used, but for the role of the neuroscience practice has now changed in a sense and become more about um, using the right techniques for the right client issues and then delivering those. What kind of uh, vibe are you getting from clients these days about neuroscience? Um, as ever, it is varied, but I, I think there's I think there was a bit of a sea change about three years ago. I would say where people, clients went from scratching their head slightly and kind of looking at it a little bit askew and saying, "Does this really work? Is this is this is this for real?" And now it's it's much more okay. I kind of know this is there, but what do I do with it? And what's it good for? How can I make it work for me? So I, I think the the basic um, I guess scepticism. It's still there to some extent, uh, but it is, it's changed now from oh, you, this can't possibly work to okay, which, which bits of this do work properly for me and where am I going to use this? We've got some clients, particularly say in places like the US and Asia, where they are building this into what they do on a consistent basis now. So it becomes a standard part of the test rather than, or a standard part of the research rather than a, uh, you know, an occasional use thing. You know, in, in Asia, there is a, a strong uh, bias in, in some of the, the work that we do for people to want to not say negative things. So, whereas you know that there's some negative reactions going on sometimes to brands and so on that they're not always articulating. So, some of these me some of these sorts of approaches end up being very attractive in those markets because you do get to see the negative responses that perhaps weren't there in, in the original conventional research. Um, so yeah, we've done probably more eye tracking and EEG work out in Asia than anywhere. Uh, and we've done probably more implicit association work in Western Europe. How extensive actually is this stuff to do compared to what you would see as being a, a comparable or something that might get you similar it, results? Yeah, like it method? is... Um, I think it varies massively depending on what you do. So, you know, the whole kind of field of neuroscience and cognitive psychology covers this huge range. You've got fMRI at one end of the scale uh, and arguably something like eye tracking or implicit association measurement down at the other end of the scale. And, you know, the, the costs involved, the practicalities involved are very different. So fMRI would be reasonably expensive to do. You get a relatively small sample of people for you know a lot of money. Something like um, implicit association work, you get you know quantitative sample sizes for something that's you know pretty cost effective. What we've tried to do is I guess <coughs> focus on the the methods that we think we can deliver in a scalable way in a cost effective way. People tend to react one of two ways. They kind of go, wow, that's absolutely fantastic. I need, I need to get involved in that. Um, or they want to run away screaming. 
and because it's so different and so you know in some ways alien to to what they're used to uh, i think again as clients are clearly kind of beginning to understand this a little better and, and find it more more um, appealing. I think the research industry is shifting from, you know, the kind of latter reaction more towards the former. Um, so, you know, we find when we do work with our um, our partners within the mill brown business, you know, people are, are getting very receptive to it because they begin to see, okay, I'm, I am getting an additional bit of insight here that I wouldn't have got beforehand. It's very difficult in some ways to take something that's, you know, purely optimised for academia and use that in in conventional consumer research. And and I think that's, honestly, I think that's a bit of a shock sometimes for some of the academics that have been working with these techniques for, you know, a lot longer than, than we have, when they suddenly see the kind of the messy real world that, that you have to then deal with in, in regular consumer research. So I think that we've been rightly quite cautious, particularly given this, you know, there's been a lot of value out of conventional research for many years. Um, it, I think we, there's an industry we've been rightly cautious to say, okay, let's test this, make sure it works make sure it actually adds something to the picture we've already got before we you know, really go for it. I think it's important that with this field we are very, very strict about things like the MRS Code of Conduct and, and, and adhering to those, those things because you know, there is that sense that, oh, you're getting at things that people aren't necessarily controlling. Um, and yeah, clearly some people are going to worry about that and are going to worry about how that, that's used. So I think you know, things like consent, things like you know, explaining what's going on and making sure clearly that you know, the, the technology isn't going to be harmful in any way, those things are all crucial. Um, I can see some regulatory challenges emerging if we don't behave in that way. I think right now, um, because, particularly because participants don't have any real objection to this, I, I think there's a strong case to be made that this is, you know, as if you like, kind of uh, ethical or otherwise as any form of research, it's simply that we have to make sure that the behaviours that we, we go through with participants are, are, are as transparent as they possibly can be.